Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you today, even though you might not be watching this in the morning. Uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to be able to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, my name is Rob Ribby, and I'm an elder here at St. Germain, and have had the privilege to be an elder for the past several years. And uh, it's been a joy on occasion to get to share God's word and uh, sub for Josh, who's in California with his family, having a break this summer and it was really a joy to be with you again. Uh, as an elder, one of the things that we get to do is meet. We meet about two times a month for most of the year and uh, talk about what's happening in our church, the financials, the strategic, the condition of the flock, what the needs are, where God might be leading us, times of prayer, uh, and it's been an incredible privilege Recently, we had an all-day retreat and spent the day pondering the idea of uh, the culture of discipleship at our church and engagement in the church. On the weekends, we have about 600, 650 people participating in our services. Um, but the question is, what percent of people are engaged in growth and service opportunities and decep uh, intentional discipleship processes outside of Sunday morning. And during that retreat, I shared a devotional from Matthew 4, which is what we're gonna talk about today, that is about Jesus' approach to ministry and a model for ministry that I believe he and Matthew, through this gospel, were giving the church. When I asked Josh, what should I preach on, I gave him three options, Matthew 4 being one. He cut me off and said, that's the one. So that's what we're talking about this morning. And uh, as we get into this time, uh, please allow me to pray and invite God's presence and spirit to be our teacher and guide this morning. Father God, thank you so much for this chance to be together online as well as in person. And Father, we just thank you for technology that allows us to stay connected even when we're apart. We pray, Lord, that your word would speak this morning, that the words that I say would be helpful to each and every one of us as we seek to follow you and to be your disciple. We give this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to turn with me to Matthew 4, starting at verse 17, we will read to the end of the chapter. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, in a boat, with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he, Jesus, went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all of Syria and they brought to him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and the paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. The word of the Lord. So what you'll notice in this passage, uh, starting at verse 17, is it says, from that time on. And from that time on, this passage is coming uh, just after Jesus' baptism, just after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness for 40 days, and what Matthew's doing here is he is uh, launching the section of the Gospel of Matthew that is about Jesus' ministry on earth. And what's interesting is that 
these eight verses that we're talking about today are basically an overview of the rest of the, of the gospel. They're an introduction, if you will. They, in a sense, are foreshadowing of what's coming. And here is the big picture. We see three components, and if your Bible is like mine, it's divided into a section with a kind of a heading that the editors have put in. And if you look at the headings, uh, it says in some Bibles, Jesus begins to preach. Others, Jesus begins his ministry. Then the second section is Jesus calls his first disciples or Jesus calls for fishermen. Uh, the next section, the last part, uh, Jesus heals the sick. Jesus ministries to, ministers to great crowds. And as I look at this introduction or this overview of Jesus' message, I see three things. First of all is a message. Secondly is a summary or overview of Jesus' ministry to a few. And then the last section is Jesus' ministry to the masses. And what I would like to propose is that these three sections and these three ideas of message, ministry to a few, and ministry to the masses really are the overview of Jesus' whole ministry on earth. What's interesting is at the end of this section, you see the results of Jesus' method. You get a little glimpse of what happens as Jesus does and lives out his ministry. The news spread all over. People brought to him all the sick, and large crowds followed him from everywhere. So something was happening. Jesus' ministry um, is producing some results. So what I'd like to do over the next little bit is to break down these three components of Jesus' ministry that Matthew kind of sets up for us and just kind of dig into them and then make application to the life of our church and how we are trying to live here at North Life in the North Woods of Wisconsin. So let's start with the message. Uh, Matthew summarizes Jesus' message with one short phrase. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is here. So, is this the summary? If you take all of Jesus' words and you put them into one sentence, is this like the heart of the heart of what Jesus is saying? I think that's what Matthew is trying to do here. What's interesting about this phrase, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, this phrase is used throughout scripture. John the Baptist uses it as he prepares the way for Jesus. In Mark's gospel, uh, the way it's stated is the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. So Mark expands it a little bit. It's basically Peter's message in Acts 2 at Pentecost. And then throughout the Old Testament, when you see this idea of repent, the kingdom of heaven, uh, Old Testament prophecy, the Jews understood this to mean that the Messiah was coming. It was a prophetic word about the Messiah. So the fact that these words were spoken here basically links to that prophecy in the mind of the Jewish people. So it's significant. It's a, it's a phrase of meaning that has been uh, existed over hundreds of years. So let's unpack it a little bit. First, we see the idea of repent, which repent means to change our mind, um, turning from one way of life to another, to set one allegiances, to shift them. There's a fundamental shift in mind and action. It's a call to remove the obstacles that hinder our a uh, way of being and to turn, in this case, towards the kingdom of heaven. In the Old Testament, this idea of repenting involves sackcloth and ashes and mourning. Repentance is basically naming and our wrong ways. It's grieving, it's releasing uh, our previous desires and replacing them with the desires of God and turning in action and attitude. So repent is about turning. It's about leaving a way of life and switching to another. And what are we switching to? 
to this idea of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus mentions this phrase, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God, in fifth, over 50 times in Matthew. It's throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. Again, for Jewish thinking, kingdom of God took them back to when there were kings, David, Solomon. Now the Romans are in place, and in their mind, it meant bringing back the political, governmental rule of God. It usually required armies and battles and force. But for Jesus, kingdom is defined differently. The kingdom of heaven is like, and then there's several places throughout the gospel where Matthew and Jesus are filling in that phrase. What is the kingdom of heaven like? It's a system where power and authority are not used for self but for others. It is characterized by a leadership of humility. In the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, which follows this passage, uh, the kingdom of heaven is characterized by those who are poor in spirit, those who are persecuted. Uh, The verse of seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. So by seeking first the kingdom of God, our needs are satisfied. The kingdom of God is extremely valued uh, in the sense that the mustard seed, a small piece grows into the biggest plant. The hidden treasure that you is in a field and the owner sells everything to go buy the field to get this hidden treasure. It's like a pearl of great price. And yet, the kingdom of heaven involves childlike faith, a simple faith. So the kingdom of heaven, in Jesus' mind, is not power and authority and government and rule. It is something completely other. Characterized by humility and service and love. So repent, for the kingdom of heaven, this new kingdom, the last phrase in this kind of summary of Jesus' message, is here. It's now. This idea that the kingdom of heaven is a present reality, it's not something that is for the future, down the road, someday later, it's for now. What Jesus is saying is, I am ushering in the kingdom. I am bringing the kingdom characterized by these things to the present moment. Jesus is exercising God's sovereign reign now. He is beginning, birthing, birthing, ushering in this kingdom of God. And what he's saying in his message is he's inviting us into that process. He's inviting the people of Israel to participate in the kingdom of heaven. We see this in the Lord's Prayer where part of the Lord's prayer is thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, here, now, as it is being done in heaven. Yet, the kingdom of heaven is not fully realized. It's in process, it's birthing, and as we live faithfully into this gospel message that we're gonna hear about in the next few sections of this passage, It becomes more and more present in our world. So I don't know about you, but it seems like there are a lot of end of the world movies. There's a ton of them. It's a whole category of movie in Hollywood. For some reason, we're obsessed with the end times. And what's interesting is that in most of these movies, movies, there's a a massive disaster of some sort, and then there's one or two people or a group of people that somehow save the world. I'm thinking Apocalypse Now, World War Z, Book of Eli, where complete destruction, but someone comes with a little seed of hope and brings life. And then the movie usually ends with this sense of This thing could go in a good direction and life could be restored. 
Jesus is basically doing that in this moment with this message. He is inviting us into that seed of hope that can grow and expand and make his presence known to the world. So as we think about the summary of Jesus' message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, there's a question for us. Are we ushering in the kingdom of God? And by we, I mean us as North Life Church, but I also mean us individually. And this is not a political agenda thing. It's not about government. It's not about who we elect for what office. It's about something completely different. And that's what we're about to see in a minute. So let's look at the next two sections of this passage and explore how Jesus is making the kingdom of heaven evident now. The next section, which is the ministry to a few, verses 18 to 22. What we see is that Jesus shows up at the Sea of Galilee and he calls two sets of brothers who are fishermen to follow him. Fishing in those days was an all-night, all-day job. These were businessmen. These were hard-working people. We understand that John and Andrew were followers of John the Baptist and that all four of them likely had been exposed to or acquainted with Jesus in some way. And what we see is Jesus' invitation. Again, another short phrase, Matthew summarizing what Jesus' ministry is all about. And the phrase is, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Over the past several years, here at North Life, we have used this phrase to kind of out- overview our perspective on what discipleship is. You'll notice the first part is come, follow me. And in Jesus' day, this meant be with, watch, learn from me, imitate me. The rabbinical method of the time is that the rabbis would call a small group of people to be with them 24-7, to learn their teaching, but also to learn their behaviors and how they approached life. The whole goal of the rabbinical discipleship method was to become like your rabbi in every way. To study the rabbi. To follow their model in life, teaching, training, and purpose. So Jesus comes at a time when following and being with and this heavy, intense relational connection is his method. And he's inviting the disciples to come follow. The next section of this kind of invitation, and I will make you, speaks about transformation, about change. Again, back to this idea of repent. Changing from one way of life to another. And what we see is that Jesus is moving them from being fishers of fish to fishers of people. It's a transformation that's going to happen in them as they walk and spend time with Jesus. At Honey Rock, where I work, um, our sign that's over the road, as you leave Honey Rock, there's a phrase on the back of the sign, and it says, came as one person, leaving as another. And this is the idea that Jesus is getting at here is coming, spending time, being with Jesus will change you, will change what your priorities are and how you're engaging the world. So come, follow me, be with me. I will make you this idea of transformation and change. Fishers of people. Jesus has a goal for them. And that goal is that they, he expects them to take on his mission and purpose. He taught them by having them do the ministry with him with the goal that they would take over the ministry for him. So how do we summarize this phrase? 
three ideas. We have come follow me, which is about following Jesus. I will make you, which is about being transformed by Jesus. Fishers of people, which is about influencing others for Jesus. And as we think of discipleship here at North Life, that's what we're thinking about. That's the words we use, the ideas we try to communicate. Follow Jesus to be transformed by Jesus so that we can go out and influence our world for Jesus. But this brings up a question. How did Jesus develop the disciples? How did he bring them through this process of transformation? And this is what's important for us as we think about becoming disciples of Jesus in a world where Jesus isn't here, in person. We have his spirit, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but how do we become disciples of Jesus in this day and age? Well, I think of Jesus' development of disciples, I think of several things. First of all is the whole modeling idea. They were with Jesus, so he was modeling a way of life. He was modeling a way of interacting with people. They could watch him and see it. Secondly, there's catalytic experiences. Catalytic uh, experiences are experiences that ignite us, that open us up to a different way of thinking, or being, they are things that challenge our assumptions. So experiences that kind of like don't make sense on the surface that force us to ask questions and see things differently. Jesus did this all the time. He touched lepers who you're not supposed to touch or even talk to. Disciples go, what are you doing? He spoke to women, a woman at the well, touched her, talked with her, Not supposed to do that. They walk up and they're surprised, they're shocked. He walked on water. He healed people. Many of the miracles and a lot of the words that Jesus said challenged the assumptions of the people and got them to see things from a different perspective. Jesus is healing on the Sabbath and challenging the religious authority of the day. We're all part of this idea of challenging the misperceptions of the disciples, this can happen for us too. If we're made a little bit uncomfortable, if we're challenged in our way of thinking by something we see in a faithful follower of Jesus or hear taught, maybe that's a catalytic experience that the Lord is using to get us to think differently. Another way Jesus developed the disciples is a lot of teaching. We see him teaching The Beatitudes is a great example, the Sermon on the Mount. But what I find interesting is a lot of Jesus' teaching was questions and stories. And most often when the disciples asked a question or somebody asked a question of Jesus, he would answer with a question. There's several places where Jesus has longer teaching times, but for the most part, it seems to be very interactive, very much connected to Stories and questions, which to me speaks to Jesus' ability to relate to people in their life situation, in the moment that they're going through, and connect truth and teaching to those moments. Another way Jesus developed the disciples is responsibility and service. He had them engaged in the work he was doing. I'm thinking of things like when he fed the 5,000, he had them distribute the bread, and I'm not sure how it worked, but as they're ripping the bread and giving it to the people, the bread was not ending. The miracle was happening in their hands. We also see stories of Jesus sending the disciples out in twos, where he sent them out ahead of them, and they went off for a week to 10 days to two weeks by themselves doing ministry in towns before he was coming. And this is a year and a half into their time with Jesus. So they're not fully trained. They don't know everything they're doing. If you've watched the the show that is on now about Jesus and the disciples, uh, Jesus sends them out and it's in the third episode um, where they're 
he sends them out and they go, what do we do? We don't know what to do. And they're all nervous and scared because they're not fully trained. But Jesus engages them and said, just go do what you've seen me doing. So responsibility and service and engagement in the ministry is part of how Jesus develops the disciples. Another way is time with the Father. We see Jesus repeatedly going away and being with the Father, modeling the type of relationship and dependence that he wants them to have with the Father. And then finally, life in community. Jesus collected these 12 disciples and they lived in a team of 12 people that traveled with him over this three years. Jesus does the development in community. And what I find interesting is that it's a very diverse team. In Jesus' disciples, he has a tax collector who's a Jew that's working for the Roman government. Uh, He's a traitor to the Jewish people. And he has a zealot who is a Jew that's a radical that wants to overthrow the Roman government. So you have opposites. Then you have two sets of brothers. And we know that brothers often are feisty with one another. One set of brothers is called Sons of Thunder. They were a rambunctious crew. Jesus purposely chose diversity and difference in his group of disciples that followed him along. So these six different ways that Jesus developed as his disciples are the way that he ministered to the few. Highly personal, highly relational, engagement in responsibility ministry, engagement in community. I work at a camp, and this is one of the things I love about camp is because all of these things, modeling, catalytic experiences, teaching, responsibility, service, quiet times, community life, they all exist in camp. It's a model of what Jesus did. And part of what the elders were asking at our recent retreat was how do we reproduce this process in church? So my question for you, as we think about ministry to the few and Jesus' investment and how he grew and developed the disciples, is are you engaged in ministry to a few? Are you close enough to Jesus that you are being transformed by him? Who are you following? Who are you studying? What are you giving your attention to? News channels? Certain leaders, certain authors, we become like those that we give our attention to. And my hope, my prayer, my challenge for us this morning is that we need to draw near to Jesus in community, engaging in service and communion with the Father such that we are being discipled by Jesus together. So that's Jesus' ministry to the few. Now let's look at Jesus' ministry to the masses, the last two verses of, three verses of the section. What we notice is that it starts with the idea of throughout Galilee. Jesus had a traveling ministry. This is a mountain, mountainous region in northern Palestine. The Sea of Galilee is a big, huge lake that's there. Um, And Jesus spent a lot of his ministry years moving around that lake, working with the different people of that region. And the key thing to note is that Jesus was with the people. Jesus was accessible. He was visible. And he was always with his little band. So as we look at this passage we notice three verbs that jump out about what Jesus' ministry to the masses involved. It involved teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So Jesus' ministries to the masses was teaching, preaching, and healing. Let's unpack this a little bit. So teaching in his synagogues. Notice 
that this is first, not preaching the good news of the kingdom. So Jesus, on the Sabbath, when the people gathered in the synagogues, was there. He went to the Sabbath meetings. These teachings in the synagogues were primarily about obedience, about how we live our lives, how do we understand God's purposes and laws, and how do we live into the way God wants us to live. So Jesus was teaching in their synagogues. He was where the people were when they gathered on their religious days and was teaching about obedience and a way of life. The next phrase is that he was preaching the good news of the kingdom. This idea of a good news of the kingdom links right back to the summary of the message that we talked about earlier where God's desire is to usher in the kingdom of heaven now and he's inviting us to join in that kingdom movement we get the sense that this type of t- preaching was outside of the synagogue. It was on the streets. It was everywhere. He was basically preaching the good news of the kingdom wherever he went. And I would propose in action and in word. So Jesus taught in the synagogues, was gathered with the people who gathered. He preached the good news out and about. And then the last part of his ministry to the masses is this idea of healing. And notice it says, every disease and every affliction among the people. What I find interesting is that Matthew gives a whole nother very long verse to describe what he means by Jesus healing every disease and every affliction. Those Afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Jesus' ministry was a ministry of healing and restoration. This is again a glimpse of the broader gospel and what Jesus is going to be doing through the rest of the story. And if we list the healings that are in the gospel, we hear leprosy, the centurion's daughter, Peter's mother-in-law, he calms the storms, calming the fears of the disciples, he uh, frees people from demon possession, heals paralyzed, raised dead girl, uh, ends bleeding, five different ways he heals the blind and the mute, he heals hunger by feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000, heals a boy that has demons and seizures. Jesus' ministry was a ministry of holistic restoration. Friend of mine that is a pastor in California, Nate Oates, who uh, Pastor Josh has referred to his book, Stability, quite regularly in the recent series. Uh, One of the things that Nate has, and I actually have the bumper sticker at home, that was a theme for his church, is that the bumper sticker basically said, or we can restore all things. And the idea is that we can fight, we can separate, we can divide, we can try and go at this world in kind of a combative hard way, or We can restore all things. We can be people of healing and restoration. And when I think about healing and what it means, I think of Jesus' again kingdom mindset, which means instead of pursuing wealth, it's about pursuing generosity. Instead of pursuing, pursuing power, it's about humility. Instead of taking and consuming, it's about service. Instead of fighting, it's about loving. Instead of fear, it's about hope. Instead of anger, it's about joy and peace. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, and he's inviting us to bring healing to the broken, fractured, angry, separated, divided 
pain-filled world. Can healing be part of our ministry? We don't often think, I think, of healing and restoration as part of what we do. We think of the message and teaching and helping people to understand. We think about building community. But part of what I wonder is if Jesus' ministry is to the masses and he's inviting us into that and healing is a core piece of that, is how do we make that part of what we do here at North Life Church. So my dad was a doctor. He was an orthopedic surgeon and a couple times growing up, I remember 10, 12 years old, I was allowed to go with him to work to the emergency room and watch him fix or put a dislocated elbow back in joint, which was quite horrifying, and rebuilding an ankle. But the question is, did my dad do the healing? No. My dad facilitated or set things up or created the conditions in which healing could happen. It's kind of like planting a seed, watering it, and God making it grow. So what is our role in healing? I believe our role is to create the conditions, a safe, loving, caring community centered on truth in which healing can take place. To introduce people to Jesus where healing can take place and to walk alongside them in that process of transformation as we talked about early, earlier. So my question for us Is are we creating the conditions for healing to take place in our communities, in our workplaces, and here at church? Do our words, our preaching, and our teaching, the truth, invite people into the hope of the kingdom of God? Another question is, do you need healing? And how can our church help provide that? and create the conditions in which healing can take place. I think that's part of why we have a prayer ministry that meets with people that desire prayer every Sunday. So in conclusion, as I think about these three aspects of Jesus' ministry, I think of the message the ministry to the masses, and the ministry to the few. The message is an invitation to join the kingdom of God and God's movement of restoration in the world. The ministry to the masses, where there's preaching, teaching, and healing to large crowds, is an introduction to the movement of God. And it's how we step in to that process but it's the ministry to the few where true transformation and investment take place. Ministry to the masses in our setting is Sunday gatherings where we hear the word of God. It's the gathering in the synagogue. Maybe healing's taking place here. It's ministry to the few where we gather and connect in smaller relational situations where we are invested in other people and purposely through action and word bringing God's truth to those places and to those people. So my question for us this morning, question for you, is are you a spectator? Are you a consumer of the ministry to the masses? Are you, just watch, are you just watching the action from the sidelines? Another question is have you experienced the transformational healing engagement with Jesus? And are you engaged in the relationships and participating in the kingdom work such that transformation 
in you is happening. And then my last question is, are you participating in the work of ushering in the kingdom of God? These are the questions I think that this passage raises for us this morning. These are the questions that as elders we're wanting to wrestle with and bring to full life in our church and make sure that we're not just sharing the message, that it's not just ministry to the masses, but that more and more people, everyone, would be the ultimate goal, is highly engaged in this ministry to a few where you are doing the ministry of the church in church and out of church, where you are ushering in the kingdom of God wherever you are. May this be so in our community. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word, Jesus. Thank you for this model of ministry. Pray that you would help us to understand the message that, Father God, we would be drawn in to the ministry to the few so that we can minister and serve the masses. I pray, Lord Jesus, too, that this would be a place of healing and restoration and that your people would be healers as we move about our communities, our workplaces, and our schools. We thank you that you spend the whole, send the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide and ever-present help. We trust you, Lord, that you would call us in and that we would respond. We give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen.